you've got a good idea for a podcast. And that's all you need. Let someone else provide the tools for recording and editing. And that's Anchor. Let someone else quickly distribute your podcast to the best platforms throughout the world. That's Anchor. Never worry about a minimum listenership or any cost to you at all with Anchor. So download the free Anchor app today or go to anchor.fm to get started. You made it back to us at Fast Asleep and thank you. If you never hear an end to our podcasts, that is wonderful. It means it's working. You're fast asleep. But just in case you continue on, or maybe you finish an episode in the daylight, please know we carefully choose masterpiece stories for you from the best authors. Today, it's Jean Stafford, a Pulitzer Prize winner, of course, born in California. Her greatest medium was the short story, so let's tuck in and enjoy one. Here it is, a country love story. An antique sleigh stood in the yard, snow after snow banked up against its eroded runners. Here and there upon the bleached and splintery seat were wisps of horse hair and scraps of the black leather that had once upholstered it. It bore, with its jovial curves, an air not so much of desuetude, disuse, as of slowed down dash, as if weary horses unable to go another step had at last stopped here. The sleigh had come with the house. The former owner, a gifted businesswoman from Castine, who bought old houses and sold them again with all their pitfalls still intact, had said, <laughs> as she was showing the place, a picturesque detail, I think, and waving it away, had turned to the well, which, with enthusiasm and at considerable length, had, she said, had never gone dry. Actually, May and Daniel had found the detail more distracting than picturesque. So nearly kin was it to outdoor arts and crafts and when the woman, as they departed in her car, gestured toward, toward it again and said, Oh, paint that up with something cheery, and it will really add no end to your yard. Simultaneous shudders ugh, coursed through them. They had planned to remove that sleigh before they did anything else. But, partly because... There were more important things to be done, and partly because they did not know where to put it, a sleigh could not, in the usual sense of the word, be thrown away, and partly because it seemed defiantly a part of the yard, as entitled to be there permanently as the trees. They did nothing about it. Throughout the summer, they saw birds briefly pause on its rakish front, and saw the fresh rains wash the runners. In the autumn, they watched the golden leaves fill the seat and nestle dryly down. And now with the snow, they watched this new accumulation. The sleigh was visible from the windows of the big bright kitchen where they ate all their meals. And sometimes, too bemused with country solitude to talk, they gazed out at it, forgetting their food and speculating on its history. It could have been driven cavalierly by the scion of some sea captain's family, or it could have been used soberly, 
to haul the household's Unitarians to church, or to take the women folk around the countryside on errands of goodwill. They did not speak of what its office might have been, and the fact of their silence was often nettlesome to May, for she felt they were silent too much of the time, a little morosely, she thought. If something as absurd and as provocative as this, at which we look together, and which is, even though we didn't want it, our own property, cannot bring us to talk, <laughs> well, what can? But she did not disturb Daniel in his private musings. She held her tongue, and out of the corner of her eye she watched him watch the winter cloak, the sleigh, and, as if she were commuting a different sum in her head, she tried to puzzle out what it was that had stilled tongues. That earlier, before Daniel's illness, had found the days too short to co communicate all they were eager to say. It had been Daniel's doctor's idea, not theirs, that had brought them to the solemn hinterland to stay after all the summer gentry had departed in their beach wagons. The northern sun, the pristine air, the rural walks and soundless nights, said Dr. Tellenbach, perhaps pining for his native Switzerland would do more for the professor's convalescent lung than all the doctors and clinics in the world. Privately, he had added to May that after so long a season in the sanitarium, Daniel had been there a year. Where everything was tuned to a low pitch, it would be difficult and it might be shattering for the boy. <laughs> Not now the professor, although Daniel, nearly 50, with his wife's senior by 20 years, and Dr. Tellenbach's by 10, to go back at once to the excitements and the intrigues of the university, to what, with finicking humor, the doctor called the omnium gatherum of the schoolmaster's life. The rigors of a country winter would be as nothing, he insisted, when compared to the strain of feuds and cocktail parties. All professors wanted to write books, didn't they? Surely Daniel, a historian with all the material in the world at his fingertips, must have something up his sleeve that could be the raison d'etre, for this year anyway. May said she supposed he had. She was not sure. She could hear the reluctance in her voice as she escaped the doctor's eyes and gazed through his windows at the mountains behind the sanitarium. In the dragging months Daniel had been gone, she had taken solace in imagining the time when they would return to just that pandemonium the doctor so deplored. And because it had been pandemonium on the smallest and most discreet scale, she smiled through her disappointment at the little man's Swiss innocence and explained they had always lived quietly, seldom dining out or entertaining more than twice a week. Twice a week? He was appalled. But I'm afraid, she had protested, that he would find a second year of inactivity intolerable. He does intend to write a book, but he means to write it in England, and we can't go to England now. England, Dr. Tellenbach threw up his hands. Good air is my recommendation for your husband. Good air and little talk. 
she said. It's talk he needs, I should think, after all this time of communing only with himself, except when I came to visit. He looked at her with exaggerated patience, and then, courtly, but authoritative, he said, I hope you will not think I importune when I tell you that I am very well acquainted with your husband, and as his physician, I order this retreat. He quite agrees. Stung to see that there was a greater degree of understanding between Daniel and Dr. Tellenbach than between Daniel and herself, May had objected further, citing an occasion when her husband had put his head in his hands and mourned. I hear talk of nothing but sputum cups and x-rays. Aren't people interested in the state of the world anymore? But Dr. Tellenbach had been adamant, and at the end, when she had risen to go, he said, You are bound to find him changed a little. A long illness removes a thoughtful man from his fellow beings. It is like living with an exacting mistress who is not content with half a man's attention, but must claim it all. Well, she had thought his figure of speech absurd and disdained to ask him what he meant. Actually, when the time came for them to move into the new house and she found no alterations in her husband, but found, on the other hand, much pleasure in their country life, she began to forgive Dr. Tellenbach. In the beginning, it was like a second honeymoon, for they had moved to a part of the north where they had never been, and they explored it together, sharing its charming sights and sounds. Moreover, they had never owned a house before, but had always lived in city apartments, and though the house they bought was old and derelict, its lines and doors and window lights were beautiful, and they were obsessed with it. All through the summer, they reiterated, to think that we own all of this, that it actually belongs to us. And they wandered from room to room, marveling at their windows, from none of which was it possible to see an ugly sight. They looked to the south, upon a river, to the north, upon a lake. To the west of them were pine woods, where the wind forever sighed, voicing a vain entreaty. And to the east, a rich man's long meadow that ran down a hill to his old magisterial house. It was true, even in those bewitched days, that there were times on the lake when May was gathering water lilies as Daniel slowly rode, that she had seen on his face a look of abstraction, and she had known that he was worlds away in his memories, perhaps of his illness and the sanitarium, of which he would never speak, or in the thought of the book he was going to write as soon, he said, as the winter set in and there was nothing to do but work. Momentarily, that look frightened her, and she remembered the doctor's words. But then, immediately, Herself again in the security of married love, she caught at another water lily and pulled its long stem. Companionably, they gardened, taking special pride 
in the Nicotiana flowering plant that sent its nighttime fragrance into their bedroom. Together and with fascination, they consulted carpenters, plasterers, and chimney sweeps. In the blue evenings, they read at ease, hearing no sound but that of the night birds, the loons on the lake, and the owls in the tops of trees. When the days began to cool and shorten, a cricket came to bless their house, nightly singing behind the kitchen stove. They got two fat and idle tabby cats who lay insensible beside the fireplace and only stirred themselves to purr perfunctorily. Because they had not moved in until July, and by that time the workmen of the region were already engaged, most of the major repairs of the house were to be postponed until the spring. And in October, when May and Daniel had done all they could by themselves, and Daniel had begun his own work, May suddenly found herself without occupation. Whole days might pass when she did nothing more than cook three meals and walk a little in the autumn mists and pet the cats and wait for Daniel to come down from his upstairs study to talk to her. She began to think with longing of the crowded days in Boston before Daniel was sick, and even in the year past when he had been away and she had gone to concerts and recitals and had done good deeds for crippled children and had endlessly shopped for presents to lighten the tedium of her husband's unwilling exile and longing. She was remorseful, as if by desiring another, she betrayed this life, and remorseful, she hid away in sleep. Sometimes she slept for hours in the daytime, imitating the cats, and when at last she got up, she had to push away the dense sleep as if it were a door. One day at lunch, she asked Daniel to take a long walk with her that afternoon to a farm where the owner smoked his own sausages. You never go outdoors, she said, and Dr. Tallenbach said, you must. Besides, it's a lovely day. I can't, he said. I'd like to, but I can't. I'm busy. You go alone. Overtaken by a gust of loneliness, she cried. Oh, Daniel, I have nothing to do. A moment's silence fell, and then he said, I'm sorry to put you through this, my dear, but you must surely admit, it is not my fault I got sick. In her shame, her rapid, overdone apologies, her insistence that Nothing mattered in the world except his health and peace of mind. She made everything worse. And at last he said shortly to her, Stop being a child, May. Let's just leave each other alone. This outbreak, the very first in their marriage of five years, was the beginning of a series Hardly a day passed that they did not bicker over something. They might dispute a question of fact, argue a matter of taste, catch each other out in an inaccuracy. And every quarrel ended with Daniel's saying to her, Why don't you leave me alone? Once he said, I've been sick, and now I'm busy, and I'm no longer young enough to shift the focus of my mind each time it suits your whim. Afterward, there were always apologies, and then Daniel went back to his study 
and did not open the door of it again until the next meal. Finally, it seemed to her that love, the very center of their being, was choked off, overgrown, invisible, and silent with hostility or voluble with trivial reproach, they tried to dig it out impulsively and could not, could only maul it in its unkempt grave. Daniel, in his withdrawal from her and from the house, was preoccupied with his research, of which he never spoke except to say that it would bore her, and most of the time, so it appeared to May, he did not worry over what was happening to them. She felt the cold, old house somehow now enveloping her as if it were their common enemy, maliciously bent on bringing them to disaster. Sunken in faithlessness, they stared at mealtimes, atrophied within the present hour, at the irrelevant and whimsical sleigh that stood abandoned in the mammoth winter. The sleigh. May found herself thinking, if we redeemed it and painted it, our house would have something in common with Henry Ford's Wayside Inn. And I might make this very observation to him, and he might greet it with disdain. And we might once again communicate. Perhaps we could talk of Williamsburg and how we disapproved of it. Her mind went toiling on. Williamsburg was part of our honeymoon trip. Somewhere our feet were entangled in suckers as we stood kissing under a willow tree. Soon she found that she did not care for this line of thought, nor did she care what his response to it might be. In her imagined conversations with Daniel, she never spoke of the sleigh. To the thin, ill scholar whose scholarship and illness had usurped her place, she had gradually taken a weighty but unviolent dislike. The discovery of this, not surprising her, on Christmas Day. It came on Christmas Day. The knowledge sank like a plummet, and at the same time she was thinking about the sleigh, connecting it with the smell of the barn on damp days, and she thought perhaps it had been drawn by the very animals who had been stabled there and had pervaded the timbers with their odor. There must have been much life within this house once, but long ago. The earth immediately behind the barn was said by everyone to be extremely rich because of the horses, although there had been none there for over 50 years. Thinking of this soil which earlier she had eagerly sifted through her fingers, May now realized that she had no wish for the spring to come, no wish to plant a garden, and branching out at random she found she had no wish to see the sea again, or children, or favorite pictures, or even her own face on a happy day. For a minute or two she was almost enraptured in this state of no desire. But then, purged swiftly of her cynicism, she knew it to be false, knew that 
actually she did have a desire. The desire for a desire. And now she felt that she was stationary in a whirlpool. And at the very moment she conceived the notion, a bit of wind brought to the seat of the sleigh the final leaf from the elm tree that stood beside it. It crossed her mind that she might consider the wood of the sleigh in its juxtaposition to the living tree and to the horses who, although they were long since dead, reminded her of their passionate, sweating, running life every time she went to the barn for firewood. They sat this morning in the kitchen full of sun and speaking not to him, but to the sleigh, to icicles, to the dark motionless pine woods, she said, I wonder if on a day like this they used to take the pastor home after lunch. Daniel gazed abstractedly at the bright silver drifts beside the well and said nothing. Presently, a wagon went past, hauled by two oxen with bells on their yoke. This was the hour they always passed, taking to an unknown destination an aged man in a fur hat and an aged woman in a shawl. May and Daniel listened. And then, suddenly, with impromptu Imprompt to anger, Daniel said, What did you just say? Nothing, she said. And then after a pause, It would be lovely at Jamaica Pond today. He wheeled on her and pounded the table with his fist. I did not ask for this. The color rose feverishly to his thin cheeks, and his breath was agitated. You are trying to make me sick again. It was wonderful, wasn't it, for you while I was gone? <gasps> oh, no, no, no. No, Daniel. It was hell. Then by the same token, this must be heaven. He smiled, the professor catching out a student in a fallacy. Heaven, she said the word bitterly. Then why do you stay here, he cried. It was a cheap impasse, desolate, true, unfair. She did not answer him. After a while, he said, I almost believe there's something you haven't told me. She began to cry at once, blubbering across the table at him. You have said that before. What am I to say? What have I done? He looked at her, impervious to her tears, without mercy, and yet without contempt. I don't know, but you've done something. It was as if she were looking through someone else's scrambled closets and bureau drawers for an object that had not been named to her, but nowhere could she find her gross offense. Domestically, she asked him if he would have more coffee. And peremptorily, he refused and demanded, Will you tell me why it is you must badger me? Is it a compulsion? Can't you control it? Are you going mad? From that day onward, 
May felt a certain stirring of life within her solitude. And now and again, looking up from a book to see if the damper on the stove was right to listen to a rat renovating its house within a house, to watch the belled oxen pass. She nursed her wound, hugged it, repeated his awful words exactly as he had said them, reproduced the way his wasted lips had looked and his bright, far-sighted eyes. She could not read for long at any time, nor could she sew. She cared little now for planning changes in her house. She had meant to sand the painted floors to uncover the wood of the wide boards, and she had imagined how the long paneled windows of the drawing room would look when yellow velvet curtains hung there in the spring. Now, schooled by silence and indifference, she was immune to disrepair and to the damage done by the wind and snow, and she looked, as Daniel did, without dislike upon the old and nasty wallpaper and upon the shabby kitchen floor. One day she knew that the sleigh would stay where it was so long as they stayed there. From every thought, she returned to her deep, bleeding injury. He had asked her if she were going mad. She repaid him in the dark afternoons while he was closeted away in his study, hardly making a sound save when he added wood to his fire or paced a little deep in thought. She sat at the kitchen table looking at the sleigh, and she gave Daniel insult for his injury by imagining a lover. She did not imagine his face, but she imagined his clothing which would be costly and in the best of taste, and his manner, which would be urbane and anticipatory of her least whim, and his clever speech, and his adept courtship that would begin the moment he looked at the sleigh and said, Oh, I must get rid of that for you at once. She might be a widow. She might be divorced. She might be committing adultery. Certainly, there was no need to specify in an affair so securely legal. There was no need, that is, up to a point. And then the point came when she took in the fact that she not only believed in this lover, but loved him and depended wholly on his companionship. She complained to him of Daniel, and he consoled her. She told him stories of her girlhood, when she had gaily gone to parties, squired by boys her own age. She dazzled him sometimes with the wise comments she made on the books she read. It came to be true that if she so much as looked at the sleigh, she was weakened, failing with starvation. Often about her daily tasks of cooking food and washing dishes and tending the fires and shopping in the general store of the village, she thought she should watch her step, that it was this sort of thing that did make one go mad. For a while then, she went back to Daniel's question, sharpening its razor edge. But she could not corral her alien thoughts, and she trembled as she bought split peas, fearful that the old men loafing by the stove 
could see the incubus of her sins beside her. She could not avert such thoughts when they rushed upon her sometimes at tea with one of the old religious ladies of the neighborhood, so that in the middle of a conversation about a deaconess in Bath, she retired from them seeking her lover, who came faceless with his arms outstretched, even as she sat up straight in a Boston rocker, even as she accepted another cup of tea. She lingered over the cake plates and the simple talk, postponing her return to her own house and to Daniel, whom she continually betrayed. It was not long after she recognized her love that she began to wake up even before the dawn and to be all day quick to everything, observant of all the signs of age and eccentricity in her husband. And she compared him in every particular to his humiliation in her eyes with a man whom now, it seemed to her, had she had always loved at fevered pitch. Once, when Daniel, in a rare mood, kissed her, she drew back involuntarily, and he said gently, I wish I knew what you had done, poor dear. He looked as if for written words in her face. You said you knew, she said, terrified. I do. Then why do you wish you knew? Her baffled voice was high and frantic. You don't talk sense. I do, he said sedately. I talk sense always. It is you who are oblique. Her eyes stole like a sneak to the sleigh. But I wish I knew your motive, he said impartially. For a minute, she felt that they were two maniacs answering each other's questions that had not been asked, never touching the matter at hand because they did not know what the matter was. But in the next moment, when he turned back to her spontaneously and clasped her head between his hands and said, like a tolerant father, I forgive you, darling, because you don't know how you persecute me. No one knows except the sufferer, what this sickness is. She knew again helplessly that they were not harmonious even in their aberrations. These days of winter came and went, and on each of them, after breakfast and as the oxen passed, he accused her of concealed misdeed. She could no longer truthfully deny that she was guilty, for she was in love. And she heard the subterfuge in her own voice and felt the guilty fever in her veins. Daniel knew it too and watched her. When she was alone, she felt her lover's presence protecting her. When she walked past the stiff spirea with icy cobwebs hung between its twigs, down to the lake where the black unmeasured water was hidden beneath a lid of ice. When she walked instead to the salt river to see the tar paper shacks where the men caught smelt through the ice. When she walked in the dead dusk up the hill from the store catching her breath the moment she saw the sleigh. But sometimes this splendid being mocked her when, freezing with fear of the consequences of her sin, she ran up the stairs to Daniel's room and burrowed her head in his shoulder and cried, Come downstairs. 
I'm lonely. Please come down. But he would never come. And at last, bitterly, calmed by his calmly inquisitive regard, she went back alone and stood at the kitchen window, coyly, half hidden behind the curtains. For months, she lived with her daily dishonor, rattled, ashamed, stubbornly clinging to her secret. But she grew more and more afraid when oftener and oftener, Daniel said, Why do you lie to me? What does this mood of yours mean? And she could no longer sleep. In the raw nights, she lay straight beside him as he slept, and she stared at the ceiling as bright as the snow it reflected and tried not to think of that sleigh out there under the elm tree, but could think only of it and of the man, her lover, who was connected with it somehow. She said to herself as she listened to his breathing, If I confess to Daniel, he would understand that I was lonely, and he would comfort me, saying, I am here, May. I shall never let you be lonely again. At these times, she was so separated from the world, so far removed from his touch and his voice, so solitary, that she would have sued a stranger for companionship. Daniel slept deeply, having no guilt to make him toss. He slept indeed so well that he never even heard the ditcher on snowy nights rising with a groan over the hill, flinging the snow from the road and warning of its approach by lights that first flashed red, then blue as it passed their house. The hurled snow swashed like flames. All night, she heard the squirrels adding up their nuts in the walls, heard the spirit of the house creaking and softly clicking upon the stairs and in the attics. In the early spring, when the whippoorwills begged in the cattails and the marsh reeds and the northern lights patinated the lake and the tidal river, and the stars were large and the huge vine of Dutchman's pipe had started to leaf out. May went to bed late. Each night, she sat on the back steps, waiting, hearing the snuffling of a dog as it hightailed it for home, the single cry of a loon. Night after night, she waited for the advent of her rebirth, while upstairs Daniel, who had spoken tolerantly of her vigils, slept. keeping his knowledge of her to himself. A symptom, he had said, scowling in concentration, as he remarked upon her new habit. Let it run its course. Perhaps when this is over, you will know the reason why you torture me with these obsessions and will stop. You know, you may really have a slight disorder of the mind. It would be nothing to be ashamed of. Why, you could... Go to a sanitarium. One night, looking out the window, she clearly saw her lover sitting in the sleigh. His hand was over his eyes, and his chin was covered by a red silk scarf. He wore no hat, and his hair was fair. He was tall, and his long legs stretched indolently along the floorboard. He was younger than she had imagined him to be, and he seemed rather frail, for there was a delicate pallor on his high, intelligent forehead, and there was an invalid's languor in his whole attitude. 
He wore a white blazer and gray flannels, and there was a yellow rosebud in his lapel. Young as he was, he did not, even so, seem to belong to her generation. Rather, he seemed to be the reincarnation of someone's uncle, as he had been fifty years before. May did not move until he vanished, and then, even though she knew now that she was truly bedeviled, the only emotion she had was bashfulness, mingled with doubt. She was not sure, that is, that he loved her. That night she slept a while. She lay near to Daniel, who was smiling in the moonlight. She could tell that the sleep she would have tonight would be as heavy as a coma, and she was aware of the moment she was overtaken. She was in a canoe in a meadow of water lilies, and her lover was, was tranquilly taking the shell off a hard-boiled egg. How intimate, he said, to eat an egg with you. She was nervous, lest the canoe tip over. But at the same time, she was charmed by his wit and by the way he lightly touched her shoulder with the varnished paddle. May, May, I love you, May. Oh, enchanted. She heard her voice replying, Oh, I love you too. The winter is over, May. You must forgive the hallucinations of a sick man. She woke to see Daniel's face, his fair pale head bending toward her. He is old. He is ill, she thought. But through her tears, to deceive him one last time, she cried, Oh, thank God, Daniel. He was feeling cold and wakeful, and he asked her to make him a cup of tea. Before she left the room, he kissed her hands and arms and said, If I am ever sick again, don't leave me, May. Downstairs in the kitchen, cold with shadows and the obtrusion of dawn, she was belabored by a chill. Ooh, what time is it? she said aloud, although she did not care. She remembered, not for any reason, a day when she and Daniel had stood in the yard last October, wondering whether they should cover the chimneys that would not be used, and he decided that they should not, but he had said, I hope no birds get trapped, and she had replied, I thought they all left at about this time for the south, and he had answered with unintelligible reproach in his voice, the starlings stay. And then she remembered, again, for no reason, a day when, in pride and excitement, she had burst into the house crying, I saw an ermine. It was terribly poised, and it let me watch it quite a while. He had said, categorically, there are no ermines here. She had not protested. She had sighed, as she sighed now, and turned to the window. The sleigh was livid in this light, and no one was in it. Nor had anyone been in it for many years. But at that moment, the blacksmith's cat came guardedly across the dewy field and climbed into it, as if by careful plan, and curled up on the seat. May prodded the clinkers in the stove and started to the barn for kindling. But she thought of the cold and the damp and the smell of the horses, and she did not go, but stood there holding the poker and leaning upon it as if it were an umbrella. There was no place warm to go. What time is it? She whimpered, heartbroken and moved the poker 
stroking the lion foot of the fireless stove. She knew now that no change would come and that she would never see her lover again, confounded utterly like an orphan in solitary confinement. She went outdoors and got into the sleigh. The blacksmith's imperturbable cat stretched and rearranged his position, and May sat beside him with her hands locked tightly in her lap, rapidly wondering over and over again how she would live the rest of her life.